Here now, welcome very, very much. Welcome very, very much, and welcome to you in the audience. We have as a guest here for this for this um, for this uh, program. We have the uh, assemblyman from the 70th uh, district here, and he's going to be talking about that that institution and about local politics. And his name is Keith Wright. He's well known to many people here in New York City and around the state, I would presume. And it's a great honor. I could welcome you to the conversation. Glad you could fit it into your busy schedule. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Harold. Share with me a little bit of your own background, if you would. You just weighed in. Uh, born and raised, educated a little bit. And then we'll get talking about the assembly and your role and uh, class distinctions within the society. They ought to be guarded against overweening power by the overwhelmingly wealthy and so forth, if we could. I know you're dedicated to but could you share your own uh, you know, birth date and that sort of oh thing? Oh, my God. Well, that could go on probably forever. Okay. I was born, uh, my mother tells me, uh, on a <laughs> very snowy, snowy day. I think uh -huh. there was a blizzard. Uh -huh. January the 3rd, 1955. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in, in the Bronx. Okay. Uh, at a place that's no longer in, ex in existence, uh, mm. a place called St. Francis Hospital. Okay. Uh, and um, in 1955. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, I guess one of my earliest recollections of going to school was at the Ethical Culture School. Yes. Uh, I was part of a grand experiment um, uh, where I was in uh, kindergarten. Okay, uh, is that on 63rd? On 63rd Street in Central Cent Park West. Major institution. Yeah, they uh, had a school going. They have a school, sure. Oh, it's actually do. a religion. Okay, uh, yeah. And they don't believe in God, but they believe in something called humanism. Major institution. Major institution. Yeah. And uh, as I said, I was part of a grand experiment. And your uh, parents chose to put you there uh, rather well, than, at let's that say, Episcopal the, School. That, well, yeah, that, mm -hmm. at that point, uh, I guess, the school, mm -hmm. they had a guy by the name of Algernon Black. Okay. Um, one of, supposed to be a great philosopher, great teacher. Uh -huh. And uh, they were looking for young black kids at that point. Okay. And my brother had gone there before me. My mm -hmm. brother, I have an older brother who's six mm -hmm. years older than I. Okay. And um, he uh, had gone there before me, so they, you know, so they, they said, well, you may as well son. Send Keith. Um, at the I, tender age of, that would be about At the tender age of four. At the tender age of four, 1959. You were early. You yeah. say it's five. Uh, you got an early start on I guess I got an early start. Okay, I guess, maybe that I guess, explains uh, your being so ahead of the curve. Oh, I don't know okay. about all of that. Oh. <laughs> and then um, lived in Harlem okay. all of my life. Okay. I live in the exact same Harlem apartment that I grew up in. Okay. Uh, my same old rent stabilized apartment. Okay. And a place called the Riverton Development, which mm -hmm. is the uptown equivalent of Peter Cooper Village and Stuyvesant Town. I see. When my father had gone off to World War II, mm -hmm. uh, and before he'd gone off to war, he married my mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that when he was coming home from the war, um, I guess my mother was in charge of finding a place for them to live. Okay. And she initially tried to go down to Stuyvesant Town mm -hmm. and um, at that point, I guess in the late 40s, mm -hmm. uh, they did not allow blacks to, um, to rent in Stuyvesant Town. Amazing proceed. Absolutely. Yeah. It's part I mean, of New York history. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this, it's part of the This is New York history. history. They yeah, did not allow blacks. Yeah, yeah. Metropolitan Life was the developer builder of uh -huh. Stuyvesant Town. Okay. And then again in 1947, right. uh, they built a piece of property which was, uh, uh, I guess, cleared out by virtue of eminent domain okay. by a guy by the name of Robert Moses. Robert Moses who, was huge. Who, yeah. who, who was the consummate uh, urban planner. Power broker. Power broker. Oh. Uh, and they cleared out, I guess, I guess about 12 acres of land on 135th Street to 138th Street. On um, what avenue? Uh, between 5th and Madison okay, Avenues. Right, uh -huh. And they uh, built, I guess, a separate, and I guess what they called equal development, okay. um, called the Riverton Development, okay. which was built by uh, Metropolitan Life, who also built Peter Cooper Village and Stuyvesant Town. I see. And okay. architecturally, it mm. looks pretty much exactly the okay, same. Okay, good. So I, I've lived there all of my life. Well, and, uh, that's and uh, it's, I had one of the best childhoods that anyone could ever think of, as far as I'm I think I concerned. had the best childhood. Did you? Well, I think so. We'll, 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 we're suburban Detroit. You know. Suburban or no, Detroit. In, in Detroit. Yeah, well, you had music. You yeah, had. Um, we had Motown. You had Motown. Yeah, but that came a little after. Yeah, that came a little bit after. Young, yeah. Impression. Yeah, but so we. Um, yeah. It we, all had to do with my mother, who was an angel. Oh, Carnegie. absolutely. And my daddy was good, too. Oh, I think sure. it was maybe the same with you, huh? Was your mommy rich and your daddy good looking, well, just like in were, summertime? Well, or they what? were both sort of in the middle. They were in the middle, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, my mother, uh, a retired um, school teacher. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. 
became an assistant principal okay. at the school, at the public school right across the street from where I live. And my father, right across from the right across community. the street from where I live. How convenient. Uh, I never went there. Though. Oh, you did I not? never went there. Okay. Never went there. I went down to the ethical culture school. Well, you were there as a kindergartner. Yeah, and I and went all there. the way through high school. No kidding. Absolutely. The, that's where you had your education? That's where I went. Wow. I went all the way through Is high that school. Thought, can that be thought of as like a prep thing? I'm prep sure it would be, but it, yeah, I guess but, uh, it, some prep school on steroids. Maybe if some got, might consider it, but yeah. it was, it's, act, it's actually a school that um, uh, emphasizes public service. Okay, emphasizes being good to your neighbor, being good to your fellow human beings. Ethics. Eth ethics. Yeah. Ethics is in the a major sense of the word, yeah. in the fullest sense of the word. Right. Um, actually, it was the only private school that was ever taken over by the black students um, because we. Um, agitated for more black studies, more black students, more scholarships and such, and we took over the school actually for four days, five Good. days, I'm sorry, Good. in March of 1970, and I was uh, in ninth grade at the time, and I was part of that. Uh, Troublemaker? That, yeah, I was, I was part, part and parcel to you. that. And I, I feel good about it. I think that was a magic time. It was really, a wonderful time. I wonder, time. 1970s, and that was, that's when Cable Access got started, that's when my friend Richie Haven kicked off the Woodstock Festival. That's singing. right. Sure. I was there in the multitude. That Were was actually there? 68. That was, no, that 69, was 69. 69. 69, yeah. Yeah, 69, no, yeah. I was actually down the road at a summer camp, at a mm. YMCA summer Didn't camp. Didn't make, would you have wanted to? You oh, were too young. You, no, I would have loved to have. What happened? Why um, didn't you steal away? We, we tried, there? but we got lost. You got lost? <laughs> <laughs> on some yellow brick road we, somewhere. Yeah, we tried, but we got, you got to remember, I was only, what, 14 at the time? 14, Thir 13, young, 14 yeah, yeah. at the time. But I consider myself a child uh -huh. of the 60s. Yeah. The school I actually went to, mm -hmm. um, very bohemian. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, I think they actually indoctrinated us and taught us all the political philosophies from the middle to the left. Wonderful. Yeah. And um, uh, wonderful educational experience. It's a major institution now. It's major. That, uh, major. Uh, that's a ma it's been there all the time. It's been there since. 1893, I believe. Okay. It was started by a guy by the name of Felix Adler. Okay. Uh, Felix Adler. Felix yeah. Adler, yeah. who um, actually wanted it. He, it. The original name was the Working Man's no School. No relation to Mortimer Adler. I don't know. Okay. I have Sorry. no yeah. idea. That's okay. No, that's Mortimer fine. Adler was a major figure in my mind. But uh, no, go uh, ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I have no Felix idea. Adler, but okay. then I, you know, and, and it was very interesting because I, you know, lived in Harlem all my life. And, uh -huh. uh, and um, went to this very, uh, I didn't know it, but I, uh, it, it came, come, I came to know that it was a very prestigious school. Yeah. And what did you do, take the two train? I, down to the I, well, train? actually, when the high school, the yeah. high school mm. is located up in Riverdale. Oh, uh, oh, I see. Up in Riverdale. And oh. so I would have to take the train. Uh, mm. It would take me about an hour and some change to get oh, to really? school each and every When you got day. to high school. But you were there in kindergarten. I was there in kindergarten. So then I took the number 10 bus. Number 10 the bus. The number 10 okay, bus. Okay, good. I'd yeah. walk over to what is now Frederick Douglass Boulevard, yeah. which was known as 8th Avenue back then. And mm -hmm. I'd take the number 10 at bus. At the tender, in the tender uh, age of ten, four? Oh, no. Well, no. I, you had to get I, No, well, I actually, uh, my parents would get me to school and what have you. Yeah, that, yeah. That sort right. of thing. Yeah, but, but you had a wonderful wonderful warm family upbringing and intellectually oh, sure. stimulating. Oh, very intellectually stimulating. Really important, I believe, don't you? I think uh, it may be more important than the schooling is what takes uh, well, place Well, over actually, the you know, period. parents, I mean, and I look at it to this yeah, day, uh, and I look at our families, mm -hmm. you know, parents are as much a part of the educational system, if not more so, uh, the parental structure, the parental, uh, I guess, uh, right. home life in yeah. and of itself uh, is just as important as any educational process that any if child not goes. More, if not saying. more so. And right. they're talking about things that really matter, ethics and whatnot, over the dinner table. Absolutely. And as the cousins come over, the yeah, uncles absolutely. or something. And it's, absolutely. It's intellectually stimulating Absolutely. Well, I, listen, let me just say, I'm sure my family was just as dysfunctional as every other family in and of itself, but I had a wonderful childhood. Just as dysfunctional. Okay, I'm Okay, uh, that that that's really it. Your dad was Bruce Wright. My dad was a judge. Famous um, to us all. Yes, um, uh, my dad <laughs> was a, a he, judge. Well, he was a lawyer. Yeah, right. right yeah. And actually, and my that, dad was a lawyer. Also. Is that right? Yeah. And in actuality, when he, you know, I remember when he used to practice law. He used to take us with him everywhere. He used to, we used to work in his law offices, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was at 160 Broadway okay. or at uh, 120 East 56th Street. And the exciting part of it yeah. was, <laughs> as I recall, uh, he used to represent uh, a lot of jazz musicians. Oh, yeah. And that was very exciting. Including Not that I Crane? even knew who, who, who these folks were, but John Coltrane, um, uh, certainly Miles Davis, mm -hmm. um, 
uh, Max rip, Roach. Ma Max Roach Max, or something else. Max Roach, uh, Art Gillespie? Blakey. And, Gillespie no, well, no, no, actually, my, I married a woman yeah. who actually, her father yeah. uh, played saxophone with Dizzy Gillespie really? for many, many that years. That horn is the yeah, company that horn, right. out of yeah, That's right. Also, oh, no. you think you may have represented my friend Ornette Coleman. Absolutely. A yeah, genius. Abs no, no, an the absolute jazz genius. genius. In that, in that uh, 50s, there was some really outside stuff coming up. No, and no question. Ornette was Texas. ahead of his time. Yeah, There's like no with Train. I mean. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I was around all these folks. Yeah. And one famous, one funny story that we have was uh, my older brother and myself. We uh, actually, my, my father brought us to the Newport Jazz Festival yes. back in the 60s. And at yeah. that point, the Newport, yeah, that point, the Newport Jazz Festival yeah. was held in Newport, Rhode Island. Yes. Uh -huh. um, so we were traveling uh, in the car. I believe Max Roach was in the car. I Good believe grief. Um, a pianist, a wonderful pianist by the name of Bobby Timmons was in the car. Okay. And, um, and, and Art Blakey probably was in the car, Good grief. and we were driving in a in a, um, in a station wagon down station. 95. It was uh. about three or four in the morning, mm -hmm. and then uh, my older uh, my brother six years older than yeah. I, and I was about I don't know eight. Uh, no, excuse, yeah, I was about I'm sorry, I was about seven years old at okay, the time, yeah. and I think it was Art Blakey that turns to my older brother and says, uh, Jeff, why don't you? It's a little late. Why don't you take the wheel of this car? Mm. So my brother, being a <laughs> natural, I mean, a, you know, nice guy, a regular mm. adolescent mm. and such, said, "Sure, yeah." He was happy to Absolutely. do it. It was about two or three o'clock in the morning, uh -huh. and so my brother got behind the car and uh, and what are you cruising six, down ninety five? He's sixty five, sixteen or something. Yeah, me, or? my probably was much younger than that. younger than that. Yeah, younger than right. probably about twelve. <laughs> And uh, my father was Car sleeping. To see over the wheel. Yeah, and my father was sleeping. Uh huh. And lo and behold, I guess after about twenty or thirty miles, yeah. my father woke up and said, "What the, the hell is <laughs> going on?" Yeah. So, uh, but so we have some very fond memories. Yeah, of, that's a great of those story. days. You could write time. that up for a uh, New Yorker or something. Oh sure. You know, like well, that. I, that would be at a, some point I do plan to write, yeah. write, write, write my memoirs at some point. You're sure. getting onto that now. You're not well, you're too young. For I'm that. a little young. Yeah. But, uh, but I've lived but a, a few different lifetimes. Well, so you had a very rich family environment and the friends, a great educational experience, and so forth. And then you went to law school. I did. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to Tufts University okay. in Medford, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, graduated in 1977 mm -hmm. and um, took a couple of From years. From law? Well, no, uh, my undergraduate. Undergraduate, yeah. yeah. And took a couple of years off. I headed an um, educational program okay. called Sponsors for Educational Opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, which basically tried to help the average student mm -hmm. get into college. Good I mean, everything you. was being yeah. done for the so-called brilliant students yeah. and such. And mm -hmm. But, you know, <laughs> What happens to the average student? I've looked over your bio. You seem to be very interested in uh, the lot and the, uh, the, the interests of the so-called uh, less advantaged people within our society, for which, if I read it right and I take my hat off to you, you seem to be very much concerned for the people that are least advantaged in well, our society I'm actually in a large measure. Well, yeah, and as I, an ethical I, principle. I would say that it's probably true. Yeah. Um, I am. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate. I've been very fortunate. Yeah. And uh, you have to, if there's one thing that I've learned mm -hmm. in, in this lifetime, is that you have to really do what you love. Thank if you. If you don't do what you love, whatever that is, yes. whether it's investment banking right. or whether it's practicing medicine or mm -hmm. practicing law, right. you have to do what you love because otherwise you won't be able to do it well. Let me ask you something, if I could philosophically veer off in a sense. How many of the, we got 6.5 billion people in the world now? I know you have about 300 million in the United States. Yeah, 300 million in the United States now, but we got how many of the world's population, two questions interrelated, if I could. How many of the world's populations in large measure in terms of their life experience and so forth are doing things in order to, let's tie it over materially to earn a living, let's say, that really do truly love what they're doing. What percentage, what percentage would we try to aim for in terms of a well-organized human society? Is it possible to get to where everybody is doing something that they really love? Or is that an idealistic notion that could never come to be because there's a lot of things that are inherently not interesting? Well, you have two questions here. I'll try I to do. answer they're both of them. And trying. they are interrelated. Mm. Your first question is, out of the billions of folks that are 6 in 6.5 billion seven, yeah. folks mm -hmm. on the earth, yeah. how many folks are doing what they love yeah. to do? 
I would say, way less than 1%. Okay, thank you. Uh, Don't you think we could do better? I that? think we could do better. Yeah, I think we could. Yeah. Now, how many people mm -hmm. are doing things just as a necessity was yeah. the second question? Well, yeah, to earn a living, they have to do. In fact, uh, if I may, I would digress a little. My, my maternal grandmother, Henry Ford, used to be tinkering in the garage of my maternal grandmother when he was about 10 years old really? before he be built. And we used to have family farms. And when you're on a family farm, you're doing a lot of different things. You're feeding the chickens, you're fixing the cart, you're driving the horses. A lot of individualized things you do. For necessity. Said, for, well, yes, that was necessity for you to get the crops. But what I'm getting at is there are a lot of things that an individual would do that they have control over. They would finish feeding the chickens, they'd do something. Then Henry Ford set up an assembly line and the farmers now, they were, that was the major occupation in 19th century, 20th century change with the individual farmer. Then people had to go, they went to the fact, they'd get factory farming. 2% of the population could feed the world with their combines mm -hmm. and whatnot. So everybody went to Detroit and stood on Mr. Ford's assembly line. Eight hours a day, they would do the same functions, you know, tailors, ideas of economics. They would do the same thing. It's hard to know how that thing, or young ladies who have to sew, sew and uh, take advantage of the fact that they're very poor, they have to do it, they do it. They do it because they have to, not because it's something, it's inherently dulling. It's like modern times, chaplain, that sort of thing is what I'm getting at. Maybe from an ethical perspective, there's too much of that in the world, and that what people have to do to earn a living is just realize they're not going to be able to do what they want or what they would like to do, or the arts, or anything that really are creatively important, they're going to have to do what the boss man tells them to do in order to have some bread to eat on the weekend, maybe cake. Do you understand what I'm saying? Totally. Okay. Um, people, I find, uh, well, let me uh, backtrack a little bit. Creativity, as yeah. a rule, is stifled in this society, and, and in most societies. Yeah. I am reminded of the film Midnight Express. Yes. Um, yeah. Billy Hayes, I mm. guess, was stuck, uh, was put into this sanitarium and everybody was walking around this wheel yeah. just one particular right. way. And all of a sudden he <laughs> goes the other way. Yeah. And I mean, it was just road like, less it just, traveled. road yeah. less traveled. Yeah. Yeah. You're not supposed to do yeah, that. That's right. You're not yeah. supposed to do that. Yeah. So, I mean. And our institutions are set up to uh, reify that. I, I, I agree. Too I much. Agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. And uh, so creativity. Creativity, I find, is stifled in, in any society. And creativity uh, is uh, wrapped up with you doing what you really want to do? Which I, I, would, I would venture to say, but Thank it's those you, yeah. folks that are creative that yeah. become the giants of any society. As Could far I as do I'm a little concerned. sidebar off that? Sure. The Balinese have a saying. They say, we have no art. We do everything as well as possible. So prepare a meal or whatever. Do you understand the philosophy? I understand, understand. They think, so right. is it possible that everyday things are more creative or could be more creative? Raising a child is a great deal of art involved. And, and a lot of creativity is involved. Creativity and all that sort of thing. So maybe we uh, limit it too much to our stars of the various forms of art and so forth rather than realizing uh, an artfully led life is an ethical life and it's one that you really enjoy what you're doing. You understand what I'm trying, I'm I trying do. to get at large patterns. I do. Well, and let me, I guess, bring us back to focus a little bit because we were originally talking about, I guess, how fortunate I was yeah. in terms of doing something that I enjoy right. doing. And, right. uh, uh, you know, and I enjoy helping people. Thank you. I can see it all over your resume. That's yeah. what I enjoy you, you doing. You enjoy helping particularly and taking the interests of some of the least advantaged people and looking out for their interests. I try. I would submit I try. I from try. your resume. Yeah, I try. And I congratulate sure. you Well, thank you. Enormously. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and thus, I find that if you do something that you enjoy, you can do it well. Listen, I don't get into my house until 10, 11 o'clock at night. At night. Each and every night. Up You're early out carousing all night? No, carousing. Well, I wouldn't call it carousing. I'm making community a joke, meetings. Though. I know, I'm yeah. A joke. yeah. No, it's, um, uh, and, and thus you can you do know, it working, well. Yeah. Uh, I have a wonderful family structure. I mean, good, I, I mean wonderful. my wife and Great. my children, they're Great. very understanding of it. Very and, important, uh, yeah. And you can't do it without a good support mechanism. I think you're right, yeah. So when did you get in toward the politics and so forth? You're now in the Assembly, 7th I'm, District? I'm in the New York State Assembly, okay. and I have the privilege of representing Central and West Harlem okay. in the New York State Does Assembly. Is that where you were raised? Absolutely. You got your home district. I got my your home district. Your That's right. Okay, That's right. <laughs> very That's good. Right. And yeah. I, um, uh, I was elected in 1992. Okay. Uh, ran in a race where you had nine other people running, which okay. is almost unheard of. Wow, that's <laughs> and a lot. It's yeah. a lot of folks. It, it become it had become an open seat. Okay. 
uh, which is rare mm -hmm. uh, in political circles for yeah. those folks that that, that, that that run for offices. Yeah. Uh, the incumbent uh, decided to retire. Um, she actually wanted her son to take over her legacy and such. And um, it was very interesting. I mean, mm. the, 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 the so-called Harlem establishment um, um, uh, endorsed him. Mm -hmm. um, the downtown elected officials uh, and the, all the labor unions endorsed somebody else. Okay. And Who I, endorsed you? I only had one person that endorsed <laughs> me. And, well, yeah, he yeah, couldn't help yeah, but endorse yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, but then again, he couldn't officially endorse me because he was American. on the bench. He was, at the, he was, on on the the he was a judge yeah. at that point, so yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I could not even have his official endorsement. But the only other person that endorsed me was uh, my co-district leader at the time. Yes. And her, a lady by the name of C. Virginia Fields. And, oh, Virginia uh, Fields. That's right. She became right. She was, borough president. Yeah, yeah, she became borough president. But yeah, she's yeah, the yeah. only other person that endorsed. And that was enough to swing it your uh, way. Well, it, it helped. Uh, uh -huh. But certainly, I think, a lot of hard work. And uh, when I mean, I knocked on about 2,500 doors. You went door to door, I right? went door to door. Yeah. And it, certainly a lot of people knew me because I had, had done a lot of work when I, uh, I guess, um, before that, I was the yeah. director of the Harlem office for then Borough President David Dinkins from 85 to uh, 1989. Okay, some of that precursor to the assembly, you had been involved in the political... Oh, sure. Arena. I had been involved yeah. in public service yeah. and uh -huh. uh, uh, had been involved in, uh, had been moving around the neighborhood. Yeah. But uh, listen, as I said, I was I'm born and reared in the same apartment that I grew up in. And That's good. People yeah. knew me and... Uh, Certainly, if, uh, I used to head my tenant association. And, Good, yeah. Uh, things of that nature. That's after law school. That's yeah, after law school. You never school. did a term at law, just straight law? I tr law yeah, I, did, I tried. I didn't like it too much. You didn't I, like it? I practiced corporate and securities law. You did? Um, okay. Worked for a sole practitioner mm -hmm. who had one client. Mm -hmm. uh, that client was one mutual fund. Uh -huh. uh, so I did a lot of the blue sky uh, and security registrations work. Yeah. Uh, and kind of boring, if you ask me. I okay. never took to it, never liked it yeah. at that point. My father was a practicing lawyer, judge at that point. I have an older brother who's a judge in okay. the Supreme Court okay. in here in New York uh -huh. as well. Uh, I had a, a couple of uncles that, that were lawyers and yeah. practiced law and such mm -hmm. and became judges. But I um, embarrassed the whole family and went into politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My daddy and used to tell me, he died when I was young, sad yeah. to say. He died... He died, uh, he was buried on his 48th birthday. Well, that was young. And that was, he was born in 1899, and that mm -hmm. was the average age for a male in yeah. the United States in 19, we've come a long way, it's about 178 come a long now. Way. Yeah. yeah, sure. Anyway, he was a lawyer, and he used to say, we used to talk law and whatnot and everything, but he used to say it's not only good for, you know, just law, doing it in the law, but also for a lot of doors that it opens up, mm -hmm. that you're getting a grounding in the society. Oh, there's no it's question. It's very important. It isn't necessarily that you practice law. No. It's a good grounding for uh, being a public no servant quit. or other things. I yeah. cannot tell you my time in law school, mm. uh, and I didn't had no idea at that point, but how it has prepared me uh -huh. uh, for doing something like this yes. or just for doing anything. I think it's probably probably one of the most versatile degrees a person can get because there's no prerequisite on what you have to do. If you have a, a medical degree, I mean, it's presuppose yeah. it that you will yeah. practice medicine. Right. Um, if you have a journalism degree, I guess yeah. you're on the road to mm -hmm. becoming a journalist. But a law degree, you can do anything you Almost, want. Yeah. And Just about anything you want. So it's a very, um, it's, it's very versatile yeah, in terms of the things you can do or want to do or will do. Yeah, and you're getting a sense of reality, aren't you? Because it's the common law and the, uh, all the institutions are based upon it. And that's oh, sure. Of, you have a, a good grounding for understanding the society. Well, this whole society is grounded upon laws. Yeah. Uh, that's what I find. Yeah, I think that's true. Noel Feldman down at the new school, a scholar, major scholar, wrote a thing about, we got a problem on the world scale now with uh, Islam. A lot of people, we have a thing in Pakistan, Afghanistan. And he, he said about Sharia, and it was very interesting thing he wrote in the New York Times uh, magazine. He said that what they're really looking for in there, let's say, just say Afghanistan, Pakistan, they're looking for a system, a rule of law. It, you could complicate, w the, the rule of law is so important for the structure of a society, people need to have some sort of a rule of law. And that's really what the Islamic, a lot of the Islamic uh, ruckus is about, is having some rules or understanding of the maybe ethical such situation by which the society is organized. Yeah, you understand what I'm oh, saying? Oh, do perfectly. So, well. rule of law is really important. Oh, it's absolutely yeah. important. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and and if you don't have it, mm. uh, they'll 
chaos can reign. Chaos in, in Bedlam. Okay, so you got into politics then, and you ran for the assembly in what year was it? It was in 1992, but okay. actually my interest yes. in politics, uh -huh. I guess, started, ooh, I just started becoming aware of it, basically. I guess when I was 15 years old, I remember um, hearing in the news mm -hmm. uh, every day mm -hmm. uh, something. Mm -hmm. I didn't know exactly what it was, but something about my congressman. Uh, oh. Adam Clayton Powell. Oh, yeah. Uh, I used Giant. to always hear yeah. of something. Right. And then how he wasn't allowed to come back into the country except on Sundays. What to, year we're looking at? Yeah, we're looking at 6970. See, that was a major time. You major time. Made, yeah, I used to King, hear it all. Malcolm. And, I, and I, remember, mm. I remember some white students at my school mm. saying, you know, at least I have a congressman, Keith. Uh -huh. You don't even yeah. have one. Your right. congressman doesn't. And that, I remember that affected me. Yeah, I bet. And, yeah. and I remember, well, you know, I don't really understand it, but that affected me, mm -hmm. and that kind of spurred me to try and get into public service. Yeah. But I remember that. And it, he it was, was inspirational? Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, right. And I, listen, I grew up in a time when Malcolm X was preaching on the street corner yeah. of 125th Street and okay. 7th Avenue. I remember yeah. seeing him and really, just hearing yeah. him. Major figure. Major figure. Charismatic beyond. Oh, no, 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 no yeah. question Real about intellect, it. Real yeah. intellect. Uh, oh, no question yeah. about it. Yeah. Uh, but these, th th this was the time that I was living in. I remember the protests yeah. in front of um, 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 oh God, Woolworths mm -hmm. uh, on 125th Street. Yeah. I remember. You mean uh, on racial lines in? Oh, yes, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember my mother used to take me to all of the protests concerning yeah. school decentralization yeah. back in the late 1960s. Right. Um, okay, yeah. When I was nine years old. Freedom Riders went down south. Oh, sure. I facing remember. those dogs Absolutely. And I remember yeah. when and I was Stokely, eight. Stokely, Stokely Carmichael. Dear friend of mine. Oh, sure. Yeah. I remember. Mm. Well, I remember and when his book came out, he mm. wrote a book called Black Power with mm. a guy named uh, Charles Hamilton, okay. who was a professor at Columbia University. I remember yeah. I was blown away yeah. by yeah. that book. Yeah, uh, he was good. These are some of the things you're always looking for something to read when you're I guess in your adolescence. That was a major. That was a major break point in world society. I do believe about 1970 we landed on the moon. Remember we walked on the moon. That was 69. Sure, 69. we walked on the moon. Neil Armstrong. About, that was about. And then about July uh, of 1969. I'm you're right. You are. And then in August of 69 we had that Woodstock festival. That Woodstock. Back to and Woodstock. And I was there among 600,000 people, all waiting for the music. And Mr. Rockefeller declared it a disaster area. And Richie Havens got up on the stage and started and sang "Freedom." That that's right. His signature song. I'm actually Kicked reading the off. book. I'm actually reading the book about Woodstock right now. It was an event, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And they yeah. say Richie just sort of made that song up as well, he, he went kicked along. It off. Yeah, and he, he kicked, kicked it off. Really he made it up as he went see, along. Yeah, too. Richie's great. He's no, no. great. Yeah, absolutely. And, go, and there was something going on. There was something blowing in the wind, Bobby Dylan told us. And that's there was. There was a major change period. That's right. And you would have been now, let's see, 16, I was 14, 14, 15 years old at so that point. So you were just coming into your And I remember the, I remember Attica. I mean, yeah. I remember Attica, Attica and of yeah. course the Vietnam War. We were pro there was Horrible. a protest a week, but one of the other big things was I remember um, the Black Panther Party used to organize their meetings on yeah. 122nd Street and Seventh Avenue. There you go. And uh, they used to have their informational meetings on every Wednesday night, and I used to uh, attend some of those meetings, much to the chagrin of both of my parents. Yeah, to the chagrin of your father. Oh sure, they didn't. Yeah. They, they, they didn't. They, they didn't want me to get hurt. Did they cotton to Malcolm? Oh, sure. They did. Oh, I loved That's Malcolm. Loved uh, Malcolm. Yeah. They just okay. didn't want me to get hurt because they knew oh, that the I police. Oh, I see. It was a personal thing. Yeah, Yeah, they right. knew that the police Well, they were, probably knew of some of the COINTEL stuff. That the COINTEL pro, sure. pro is going on. Well, it's just horrible. I man. actually wrote my thesis yeah. on the COINTEL pro program really? okay. uh, in law school. Okay. I Good. had a professor by the name of Arthur Canoy, who okay. uh, certainly was, he was Adam Powell's lawyer. No fooling. When, yeah. when uh, during the big case, Powell versus McCormick, mm -hmm. when they tried to eject Adam Powell from Congress Adam because Powell, of his yeah. um, so-called mm -hmm. transgressions. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So you were raised in a real, it was a cauldron of things going on at that time. Oh, yeah, it was a great time. And then you went through all of that and everything. And then um, then the assembly, what prompted you to run or say, well, let's throw my ring in for the yeah. assembly seat? And then share with us the assembly. You're the seventh district, right. and the assembly represents the state of New York. That's right? right. And how many are there? Is it like the House of Congress and uh, uh, House of Representatives? Very in similar. US Congress? Very similar. Um, we 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 have 150 assembly members okay. in the state of New York, uh -huh. and it is very similar to uh, Congress in the United States Senate. Right. We have the New York State Assembly, 150 yeah. uh, uh, state assembly members, okay. and you have 61 senators. Wow. Okay. Uh, okay. So you have a 211. Uh, representatives uh, on the state level. Right. Uh, the Assembly or the Senate will uh, put forth uh, a concept 
a bill, mm -hmm. uh, draft a bill, mm -hmm. and uh, each house will vote on the bill. Right. And um, when it is passed by both houses, mm -hmm. then it goes to the governor to either uh, uh, either veto or sign into law. Mimics the federal structure. Absolutely. Uh -huh. No question. Yeah. No question. The Been state. there a long time since Peter Stuyvesant's days? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Really? Yeah. yeah, sure. Goes back 1609. It goes back to the 1600s. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. We're, st we're celebrating 400 years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and the state capital is in Albany, New York. It was not always there. At one right. point it was in Kingston. Well, Kingston, I remember at one point I used to teach in New Falls. Right, across the at river one point it was in Kingston, mm -hmm. uh, and it might have been in New York City for, for a moment, but uh -huh. yeah, and um, it's, it's the capital state of New York, mm -hmm. and we make laws okay. for the state of New York. That's okay. what we do. Work closely with the city council or the borough, uh, the mayor of New York? Different mayor, level or of how does that, government. How do those two yeah. things interrelate Different in reality? level of government. Of course, we're all interdependent on each other. Each sure? level of government is right. interdependent on each on, on each on, on, on themselves and each other as far right. as I'm concerned. Yes. Uh -huh. um, actually the way it goes is that the federal government passes their budgets, right. budgets come into the state of New York mm -hmm. and then again we filter it down uh -huh. to the city of okay. New York because uh, uh -huh. the city of New York is its own separate uh, corporation. Okay. And uh, that's why you have the Corporation Council. They represent the city of Corporation New York. Corporation Council? Corporation Council is the, the legal entity. They're the lawyers for oh. the city of New York. Is that the mayor's office? And that, well, no, it's not no, the mayor's, mayor's office, office, but it's, it's the, the city the, council. It's the city. They're the lawyers for the city. Uh, the, the city okay. of New York is its own separate corporation. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I didn't realize. That. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. And yeah. Um, so what happens is that, um, you know, the monies, I mean, we filter all the money. Yeah. So those are the three levels of, of government, which is separate and distinct uh -huh. from the judiciary, uh, legislative, and um, executive branches. Okay, that's good. And then you represent the 70th district. I, represent, Harlem, I represent God's country, God's the center country of himself. the universe yes, as far okay. as I'm concerned. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, Central and West Harlem, which is the Apollo Theater, yeah, Schomburg it. Center yeah. for, for, for Black Research, yeah. uh, City College. Right. Um, uh, City College. C City yeah. College. Right, 138. Absolutely. Yeah, right. um, um, Sylvia's Restaurant. Yes, I mean, right. The there's whole just a thing, whole yeah. lot of things going yeah, on. What a town. great part of the world. Oh, huh? listen, when you, yeah. wherever, you, wherever mm -hmm. I go, mm -hmm. uh, wherever anybody comes from, yeah. and they say, where do you represent? All I have to do is say, I represent Harlem. Everybody, and they, everybody knows. knows. Everybody knows. Is immediate yeah. recognition. <laughs> right, right, immediate right. Immediate net recognition. Now, so. you're passing laws up there, and there's a, there's state, there's a, we have taxation involved. We have that kind of thing. We have representation of the people. Um, so it's at a different level, a state level, and it's a different, and how do those things relate? In ter and then we have, we're within a federal structure, too. How do we, we were talking about common law, we are talking about the structure and rule of law. How do those things relate in terms of realities that affect the people themselves that make up the population? Oh, of those various, oh, listen. Just, even though it's federal, state, and local. Oh, no, absolutely. Mm -hmm. How do they all In relate? order for Mayor Bloomberg, yeah. I'll give you an example. Please. In order for Mayor Bloomberg, uh, you remember when he was trying to put forth something called congestion pricing? Uh, yeah, on traffic, yeah. On the well, traffic. Right. But he like had to come up to the state of New York okay. to give him the authorization in order to pass something on congestion pricing. Okay, let me ask you, why did he have to go to the state? Is because the New York he did not have problem? the power to do it, right. Why? Uh, the way it's, 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 yeah, the way the system's set up. Because it interrelates. Okay, right, but yeah. he had to get the approval from the state of New York, Okay, and which we did not give him. Uh-huh. Which so we did that's, not give him. So that's a reality that anybody in a position of executive authority has that's to take right. into a mind that's what right. the political realities well, this, are. At the, and then that has to be nested within a federal structure. Right. Remember, well, Mr. Kennedy had to send federal troops into Mississippi and all That's that, right. You know? That's right. Okay, that's so right. that's a... That's a, that's a, a and, and our, our main political leader still is Obama, uh, Barack Obama, at the federal level. Who made so a great speech last night I on think so, healthcare. too. I thought it was really inspiring. You know, in order to be, uh, the, I guess, the chief executive of mm -hmm. the nation, yeah. uh, you have to be a good salesperson as well. Okay. And I thought Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, was very sold it. Yeah. And he sold it, and he was very presidential in the manner in which he sold his concept for uh, health care for the That was uninsured. my impression. I was enthralled. That was one of the best speeches he ever gave. I, I thought so, I too. mean, particularly within a political realist And concept. if you saw the speech mm -hmm. last night, mm -hmm. when you saw some of these disgruntled Republican folks yeah. that were heckling, yeah. um, 
You're yelling lying. out from the crowd. <laughs> the guy never, shouting, I've lying. never ever mm. seen that yeah, right. you, in a, you know, being done to a president in the House, in, in, in the House of Representatives, mm. in Congress. No. I thought it was tremendously disrespectful, and you've never heard that done you ever before. Do you ever see the carryings on in the House of Commons in Britain? Oh, I have. They sure. shout at each other and say, That's, down with the dog Well, and I, all I, mean, I can say is, tradition. I just thought it was, it was very disrespectful yeah. to President Obama, mm. because I cannot ever remember mm. Democrats when George Bush was president, mm. uh, when Bill Clinton was president. A lot of people might have wanted to shout it they out. They wanted, but they didn't. Yeah, right. But huh? they did not. Yeah, even when the issues were even more intense. They yeah, did like not. They yeah. did not. Well, it's and, a tradition. And they, the Republicans want to uh, anchor us to history. You know, they would want to do that. And I think probably there, there's a responsible role for that kind of way of seeing things, re subsuming the old. Things move along, things move along. Technology, science, everything matches, things change. And so what was, a, what was appropriate 100 years ago is no longer appropriate. There's change has to come. And so there are some who want to make sure that we anchor it to the constitutional principles that have got us to where we are. Others want to try and make the big change. And that's a big dialectic that goes on all the time in human societies, I guess. There's nothing wrong with changing things and, and, and changing things for change's sake, but there's also something wrong with being disrespectful as far yeah. as I'm concerned. And that's what I thought some of those um, legislators, those Congress people, those senators, I, see I thought you, they were tremendously disrespectful. I see, disrespectful. young man, you learned your lessons well at the kindergarten of the Ethical Society. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, that's an, ethical, of, that's an ethical principle. Some of my professors would probably uh, disagree they would, they would with you. Really, they would probably they disagree. Would astray or something? Yeah. Like, well, usually you did, yeah. And, 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 and so it does question. Another thing, we got a president at the executive level at the federal level. We have a mayor here in New York City. Who is it? It's the governor then at the level of the state? Yes, the and governor. So, yes. so these things all nest and so forth. No question. Okay. You, uh, it's committees, I suppose, in the Congress of the United States, seniority matters. Uh, Absolutely. You know, committee chairman, assignments, sure. all that. Same thing in the state of No Assembly. question. I'm, mm -hmm. the, I'm the chair of the Social Services Committee. That's a very important committee, I yeah. would think. Yeah, yeah, no, when you think about it, it's um, social services takes up one third of the state budget, which goes up to about, takes about $120 billion a year. Is that with a B? That's with a B. That's real money. That's they would, real Ever, money. Do, you're too young to remember Ever I Dirks. do remember Ever Dirks. Yeah, right? Ever Dirks, the Evan Charlie show, and he said, you get, you're talking about the budget, he said a billion, million dollars here and a million dollars there. It so finally it, adds up to real some money. some real money, that's yeah. right, that's right. Yeah, you're right. dealing with real money on the committee that's there. Right. And you're also dealing with uh, 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 issues that really uh, directly affect the people. Real people. And if I may, it seems to me, reading your bio again, you are dealing with things that vouchsafe the interests of some of our least advantaged people within the society. The best advantaged people are well taken care of by big law firms and lots of moneyed people. Overwhelming amounts of money of the tax credit that, or the tax uh, cut that Mr. Bush put into effect went to the upper 1%. No question. No question. Huge. In One of the There's a lot of interests that are there, but you're looking out after the interests of some of the, fo the folks. Well, I'm trying if to. It seems to me by your, your rent stabilization, these kind of issues. Well, let me tell you. It. Let me tell you. When I was growing up, with. and what, why I say Harlem was the center of the universe as yeah. far as I'm concerned, you could have folks that living on one side of you, the middle income, maybe mm. their, their father was a fireman or a police officer or what have you, or mm. sanitation man, right. bus driver. Mm. On the other side, on the other, the next apartment, someone was on public assistance. Yeah. And okay. one of the big, and, and that, that stays with me. Yeah, thank uh, you. Let me just tell you this, one of the big achievements that, that I'm very proud of mm -hmm. this year as mm -hmm. chair of the Social Services Committee yeah. was that we were able to raise the allotment that those folks on public assistance are able to get. Wait a minute, public assistance, oh, okay, okay. Uh, you, you were able to get more money for that. Absolutely. Okay. And let me just tell you, that allotment yeah. had not been raised mm -hmm. in almost 20 years. No kidding. Uh, Why wasn't it raised? Because Why didn't there it wasn't the track inflation or something? B right, exactly. Because, yeah. yeah. you know, let's, let me just tell you. Mm. Folks in public assistance were getting 200, let's say, $291 a month. You now, how you can exist on that in the city of New York? In the city of New York is absolutely astounds me. Your place where you live is still rent stabilized. It is. Okay. It, it is. That that's come into the factor apart from just strict market 
principle or market signals. Oh no, the, you, there has to be something to go against just strictly market signals. Oh, absolutely, because it would be runaway. But good can, for the problem. Imagine a person. Well, I can barely afford to live where I live as far as I'm Even concerned. Even though it's rent control. <laughs> Even though it's rent anyway. mm. But listen, I pay exactly $100 a month that rent. That much? Yeah. That's oh, no <laughs> wonder you're so troubled. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if my family wants me to telegraph yeah, no, my rent here. Yeah, you don't do on it on television. television but, no. but imagine, mm. imagine being a family of three, a family of four, being able to just take home $291 a month. You have to become hardly. creative, you have to yeah. become inventive, yeah. and you have to, uh, your survival skills come into play. Yeah. So and had that allotment had not been raised in over 20 years. Okay, why is it that it is so behind the curve for 20 years that there aren't interests within the political process to look out after the interest of the least among us? The gospel said we should care most for the least among us. I agree. You understand, we don't seem to be living up to that charge very well, do we, or have we? No, we have not. Okay. Uh, let me just say this, um, um, and you ask why yeah. it had that, because you know, I can see you're surprised, and most people don't even think about it. Mo don't even think about those folks that are in that predicament. Okay, now, what does that tell us about the society? It tells us that we, what is it, Dostoevsky, mm. what did he say? He said, if you want to look at our society or get a true picture of our society, mm -hmm. look at our prisons. Is that yeah. what, I think it's crime and punishment. Uh, if he didn't say it, yeah, somebody something like should, that. Yeah. But, 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 and certainly those Two folks. Two and a half million people in prison in this country now. That's true, and you have 70,000 in prison here in New York Big State alone. Big growth industry. You, you do, but getting back to the folks on yes. public assistance. Okay. You know, you asked me why it hadn't been raised. Yeah, well, uh, systemically. Well, th because there was never the political goodwill, mm -hmm. and a lot of folks think that folks on public assistance don't vote, which is absolutely not true. And they, they do think, vote? Oh, sure they vote. They do. But they also okay. think that most of the folks on public assistance are people of color, when in fact, when in fact, uh -huh. studies have been done, and I don't know it uh, definitively to be true, mm. but I would say that there are just as many white folks on public assistance as there are people of color. Happy to hear that, but I'm also unhappy to hear that there's so many people think that if it was people of black, it wouldn't matter. They wouldn't, that's but, been but, a but problem see, but, that we're finally getting over but after there, many and long that's true, and that's true. centuries. But there was never the political mm. will. So mm. what mm. Governor Patterson and myself were able to do, mm -hmm. uh, we were able to raise the uh, allotment uh, 30%. Okay, that's a 10 lot each and every year. So okay. in, in, in three years, mm -hmm. uh, they will have a total 30% increase. They're getting 10% each and every year until it we reaches try 30. To do that and then as far yes. as I'm concerned, yes, we're going to have to do it again. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we put something in place where it would just automatically be there. Absolutely. Uh, they got a thing called the work ethic. And they think that people, if you really, the reason that you're not doing well in the society is because you just haven't applied yourself and you're not disciplined and all that kind of thing that they put down on the people. Uh, th that's the traditional thing. The capital assets are increasingly responsible for the production within our society. And the capital assets within our, you did stuff at the corporate level with one mutual, f one fund. Mm -hmm. uh, the capital assets are owned by a tiny plutocratic class. Okay. In this political economy of the United States of America, in virtually all political economies across the world, and in the international order, it's a small plutocratic class that owns the means of production, and everybody else is like, or it could be seen, if you stretch it, like a serf on a feudal estate, picking up the leaves, the templates all set by those with the money and the power. Everybody is syncophate to that. You know, they have to be in order to get, you know, and that sort of thing. And that's a broad problem that the world is confronted with, the haves and the have-nots, the haves being a very small class of people who tend to lord it over the rest. Am, okay. I out of de am I out of sync with the way the world is No, organized? I think you're right on point, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and what can we do about it who are concerned about the lot of the people in a democratic context, mm -hmm. and not only politically, but also economically? Well, depending upon the issue, mm -hmm. uh, I think that there has to be more involvement mm -hmm. uh, with just the general public, yeah. with who their legislators are. I yeah. can guarantee okay. you, mm -hmm. I can guarantee you that if we were to walk out of this studio yeah. right now, right. Uh, and if someone is bothered by an issue, we're around the corner from John Jay College. Yeah, yeah, right I can guarantee you if you Big ask, expansion. I, can, if, I, would, mm. I, would, I would, I would, I would, I would make you a bet of five dollars if you asked the first ten students walking out of their doors right mm -hmm. now who their legislators are, either on the local level, on the state level, or on the federal level, they wouldn't know.
they would not know. Okay. And meanwhile, uh -huh. those folks on the local level, state level, federal level, we are making decisions yeah. for them, about them, uh, concerning that affect them, their lives. and affect their lives each and every day. And that's the difference. Um, I just, I, yeah. I mean, this past year is the first time I really saw some activism in our college students because okay. back in when we were talking about in the 60s and 70s, yeah. I thought that there was a lot more activism, mm -hmm. a, a lot more social awareness, yeah. um, a lot more civic awareness uh -huh. uh, with, with, with college age folks. Right. But I would guarantee you that not, I would say maybe one out of 10 would know who their local legislators were. Uh -huh. And so that's the way that I have found in order to effectuate change, uh -huh. um, is that um, you have to do it uh, on a legislative level. And that's okay. the way I've chosen, yeah. and that's why I ran for office. Okay, good for you. And you've been there now since what year? Nin for, for, for 17 years. And you've become chairman of that major committee. I've, I've become chair of the Social Services Committee, which in actuality takes up about one-third of the Budget. budget of the state of New York, which ranges from about 120 to 125 billion dollars a okay, year. Okay, now you represent the people of Harlem and uh, your district, obviously, like a congressperson would, and then you also represent, to a degree, do you speak for or have resonance to the needs of the people of the nation? Oh, or well, no, let's not say the nation, let's say the state. Oh, of the sure. State. You take into account oh, sure. the situation. In terms when, of oh no, ab you're absolutely right, Harold. So that you can yeah. work with the executives that oh, are dealing sure. with the state. Oh sure. What yeah. happens? What I find. And is then that also, if I may, with the federal. Oh sure. Because it's all part of a no question. seamless web. No yeah. question. When you're mm. elected as a state representative, right? Whatever you vote on, uh -huh. whatever you um, deal with, affects the whole state of New York. Right. I've gotten intimately involved in all sorts of issues, whether right. it's Rockefeller changing the Rockefeller drug laws. Thank you. Or mm. or whether or not people can hunt on Sundays up in Buffalo somewhere, because well, I know nothing this, about hunting. What's this? What, what the hell is that? What, what happened? Well, I'm saying you these hunt are, on Sunday? <coughs> I don't know. I'm just giving it no as an example. On uh, yeah, it's, movie, it, no. it, there, was, there was a law that I had to vote on, uh. whether or not people could uh, hunt on certain Sundays or something like that. And <coughs> as a state legislator, you vote on these things. <laughs> yes. I mean, oh, you vote oh, on I a see. whole yeah, it's like the slew right. of issues. Right, so you have to You have folks, you have, mm. whoever our local congressperson right, is, is yeah. voting on something concerning no. Oklahoma. Okay. Not, but, but, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. It's, somebody, yeah, it goes up the line. Yeah. It goes, so somebody yeah. in the city council uh -huh. may be voting on something, who represents Manhattan, right. will probably have to vote on something concerning Staten Island. Uh -huh. So whatever we vote on right. concerns... The, 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 the um, 18 million people mm. here in the state of New York. Yeah, you do so, have to have that. Oh, it. no, absolutely. To so, what degree do you resonate to the needs of the people of the nation? Uh, and then I could go further. We've got the United Nations. We've well, got everybody in the world. As far here. as I'm concerned, yeah. as New York goes, goes so goes, goes the nation. nation. <laughs> I think somebody said that before you, but it's a I'm good I'm sure thing. they did. Yeah, yeah, it does like that. Or Charlie Wilson said, what's good for General Motors is good for the nation. That's I'm not right, sure we right. want that to hold that's nowadays. True, that's yeah, true. Yeah, that's a problem and everything. Well, it's a great responsibility, and you're having a good, you're enjoying your work. I try and have a good time wherever yeah. I go. Harold. Okay, that's a good idea. That's a good general Whatever idea. I do. That's a lesson, again, from the I try and have society. a good time no matter what yeah. I do. Yeah. Uh, I understand you're also interested in, I understand that you are going to participate up in November on a, a behind the bench thing. And yes. It's going to be there. And it's going to involve Jay Danksburg, Esquire, and uh, right. some other lawyers and so forth. They're going to be looking at the judicial system because there's a lot of miscarriage of universal justice, if you would say that, by a judicial system that is not adequately able to, uh, to, to deal, again, with the class differences that exist inherently in a society, uh, the racial district, uh, pr prejudice and so forth. So you're going to be looking at the judicial arrangement and how it might be able to be improved. Again, if I read your bio right, interested in the interests of some of the least advantaged among us as groups and individuals. I am going to participate. I believe it's uh, being scheduled for the end of October. Okay. Um, my father, uh, who is, you've spoken about before, Legendary. Uh, was a, is a judge, mm -hmm. uh, wrote several books. Yes. One book called Black Robes, White Justice. And the I other read book it with great interest. The other book mm -hmm. called Black Justice in a White World. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he authored about eight or nine books. Yeah, bless Island. him. And uh, he, he died about five years ago. Sorry. He died. That's he okay. was a giant. He, yeah. Oh, no, no, he died. Mm. Listen, my father did very well. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. He was. Brought uh, you up. Yeah, well, yeah. 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 He married um, uh, six times and oh, wow. had um, six children. 
mm -hmm. and uh, none of us were digging in his pockets for any money, and mm -hmm. and he died in his sleep at the tender age of 86 years okay, old. So God. he did fine. Bless him. Yeah, he did right. just just fine. And right. I think he helped a lot of the least minded among us. And he did. Listen, I, and on that racial thing, it was such a burning issue. I run mind. into and it, it remains. On a world scale. Oh, no question. Oh, no we question. haven't got it all solved. Harold, I there. run into someone every day, mm -hmm. every day, mm. that tells me that, uh, you know, your father cut me loose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, your father did me a favor, and now I'm doing just such and such and such. Mm -hmm. and, but if it were not for your father, mm -hmm. I'd probably still be in jail somewhere. Mm -hmm. But I, I run into someone every day. Yeah, those reactionary that. sentiments run so deep, <laughs> particularly when people are alienated. And the general society is one that creates alienation There's within no the doubt people. There's no Because it's not really yet where the future requires. Some big changes are needed. There's no big question. changes needed at all levels. Health care is one thing that oh, we'll no finally question. get around sure. to maybe, sure. but on a larger scale. Well, and listen, you our know, judicial, you know I do, and our yeah. judicial system has mm -hmm. certainly uh, been inherently racist. Why mm -hmm. is it that um, you know, most of the folks you see in the court system, in criminal court, mm. are all people of color. I Black mean, I would say brown. 85 mm. to 90 percent, especially here in the city and throughout the state, are 85 to 90 percent. Must be genes. It, it has got to be. Yeah, yeah it's it got to be. Warming. Our, our it's prison so, system. It's so, it's so racist. It's our disgusting. prison system, the 70,000 out of the 70,000 inmates that we currently have yeah. incarcerated here yeah. in the state of New York, yeah. 85 percent are people of color. Okay, again. Again. People uh, of color, you're talking uh, black and black Latino? And brown. Black, black and brown. Black and Latino. Black, right? black and Latino. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, foster care? Foster the children the being same taken thing. from them, again, it's all 85, no, 90 percent. No question about it. You understand? I understand perfectly. I guess you perfectly. know that better than I do. I understand perfectly. Yeah. So Listen, what, what can we do to improve that? Well, life? I think we certainly or what need... what can uh, you do, particularly in your position? Well, and certainly... Um, and uh, what can we do to help you do what you can one do? One of the things that I've tried to do uh, in my legislative capacity... Yes is that I have refused to be a part of building any more prisons here in the state of you New York. You have. Oh, absolutely. Do you uh, take flack for that? That's a growth industry, it's brother. It's a growth industry. Well, you got to remember. You're, gonna, you're cutting against the tide. Well, if you look at the prison system, yeah, most of our prisons are in upstate New York. Yeah. Now, I have traveled to these towns. Yeah. I remember traveling through um, Clinton, yeah. New York, and you okay. have the big Clinton, Clinton Danamora prison. Yeah. And I've been to a lot of these prisons. You have. And, oh, sure. Sure, I'm on the correction committee. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's part of the subcommittee of the No, it's a different committee. Different committee. I, I don't chair this committee. That committee is chaired by a wonderful legislator by the name of Jeffrey on Aubrey that represents Queens, who actually was the author of the bill to eliminate the Rockefeller drug law. Oh, good. Is that is that working its way through? Now? Oh, we, it, we've eliminated them. Congratulations. I didn't realize. No, no, no. They were it was a great victory. Uh, Governor Patterson yeah. signed yeah. the bill mm -hmm. to eliminate. The yeah. draconian Rockefeller drug laws. It was awful. There was, was a, that was a that was a single focus issue that was just all horrible. out of sight. Yeah. Horrible. But I've traveled. Anyway, how many committees are you on? Oh, probably around five or six. Five or six. One yeah. of which is this uh, prison committee or uh, concern. the correction committee. Correction yes, committee, they call yeah. it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, what I was going to say is that I've traveled to these upstate towns, and you have to remember <laughs> these little towns. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the whole town, the city, the mm -hmm. hamlet, whatever it is. Is it, company it, town? That's a company town. And yes. Company being yeah, the, the prison. prison. Yeah, that's how they eat. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the uh, little houses, and each each house has maybe two ch two two cars and two point two children, mm -hmm. and and but for the prison, mm -hmm. if it be, were not the prison, these they'd folks be homeless. they would be homeless. Almost, yeah, yeah, right. exactly. Okay, now that's a that's a model that is not a particularly good one, yet it's growing. They got pro they're having real problems out in California. They got real. Po I understand they're not being able to keep the prisons going because they haven't got the money. They're in such deficit up there in California, Schwarzenegger and so forth. They're having a hell of a time keeping the prisons open. The, uh, prison, the still prisons, having, much less and, the state of New York being a state of California being able to function. Yeah, and the draconian kind of nature of the people who are out to try and you know uh, to to put everybody in the prison as a way of teaching them a lesson or some damn thing are, are uh, still pressing that kind of thing. And that's out of date with what we need. We need more justice in the system so there aren't people that are in any kind of way tempted or forced to go and do and, and, and not have a life where they're going to be able to not be subject to a possible interpretation, draconian uh, interpretation of some moralistically, uh, you know, too, too stringently drawn principle that is the lot of a lot of people who say, I'm fine, they're not, put them in prison. They take, they, they scapegoat. 
a scapegoat the people that are do you understand what I'm saying? I do. It's too, it's too prevalent in New York City, too prevalent in New York State, too prevalent in the United States, and in the world. One of the basic tenets of capitalism. Yes, sir. Is uh, that what I've, I guess what I learned years ago is that you have to have a pool of unemployed or unemployable people in order to uh, have them be servile. To have them, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. right. It's like the Marxists. I'm not a Marxist, absolutely. but they would call them wage slaves. Exactly. And it's absolutely true. You have to have that pool. Yeah. You have to have that pool. Well, in order for that system to, to operate. survive. Yeah, in to order for survive. The and to so they survive. have to be learned to be sycophant. A lot of our institutions are authoritarian, and they're, they have to be taught to fit into authoritarian structures where they'll do what they're told by the boss man. Now, what I've been, what, and of course, I talk to those folks that mm -hmm. are the unemployed or mm -hmm. the unemployable. Mm -hmm. I talk to them all the time, those yeah. folks just coming out of uh, uh, the, the, the prison system right. and such. Yeah. And the only thing. Yeah that they want. The only thing chance. that they need is a chance. A job. A job and a chance. Okay, a job and a chance. A job and a chance. A job and a chance. That's uh, all they want. Lord Keynes said that we were going to... Otherwise, they, that breed, you know, what they go back into, it breeds recidivism. When you say you need a job or a chance, what they need is income in order to be able to live, for one thing. And Lord Keynes, who wrote all of the, you know, the stuff after the Second World War, major figure in terms of economic theory and so forth, wrote a letter to his grandchildren, mm -hmm. 1930, it's about now, their maturity. He said, the world is going to be confronted with something that's hard to imagine, technologically induced uh, massive unemployment. Hmm. That the means of production is going right. to become... It can be done by robots. Well, computers. Yeah, not, not go too, yes, it's computers. Hap well, there it's, it's happening happen now. No, it's happening, and so that we distribute income. All income is distributed to the mass of, outside of the plutocratic flu, few have uh, ownership of uh, uh, right. capital right. assets uh, by having a job. Right. And you, so you have to be sick of it. You have to be sick of it to be on the job. That kind of thing. It's like wage slavery. And it's you know, out of touch with what's needed. We have to have some alternative way for people to get income other than through labor. But labor is reified as a moral principle, the work ethic and all of that. And that's not in keeping with what the future requires. We need a new way of distributing income so that there will be demand to clear the market what can be produced. We can produce more than we're ca we have the means of clearing the market because the people don't have money to buy what we're capable. We don't have a system the future requires to do what we're capable of doing. We don't have a system in place that lets us collectively do what the human society is capable of with the technological augmentation. Now, major change is needed, and it has to be done at all levels, and you're working in that venue, I would presume. Trying. Okay, good. Well, it's a great fight, and you're doing a great job. Thank you. And I want to thank you very much for finding time. Busy schedule. My pleasure. Is there an election you're ho you have to do? No, I don't, I don't. I'm not running until next year. Not until next year. Yeah. Well, next year is just around the corner. Absolutely. Okay, so keep running. Thank and you. Keep doing all that good work. Thank you. And it's been your great good pleasure to have the perceptions of Keith Wright. He's an assemblyman from the District 70 in New York City, uh, 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 a, a, a jolly good fellow who attended the Ethical Society, well ethically Shh, bound. Don't say that too loudly. No, no, I think it's a great institution. I'm sorry, it was a great. No, it's fine. Uh, it's honorific. Fine. <laughs> and uh, thanks a lot for coming. Your pleasure. My pleasure. To have his perception.